At this video we will learn how to apply a voltage across a load in either direction with variable electric power. The circuit used for this enterprise is called H-bridge. In the most simple case, the circuit is composed of four constant resistors. Caused by the bridge, hence the conductive path at the middle of the circuit, the voltage drop across both lower resistors is equal, just as well as those at the upper ones, independent from the resistance values of the four devices. Without the bridge, the potential at the middle points depends on the ratio of the resistance values. If R1 divided by R2 equals R3 divided by R4, the potential between the middle points is zero even without the bridge. Caused by the tolerance of the resistors, we can detect a slight difference in potential of 27 mV. At the video about voltage dividers, an H-bridge composed of two potentiometers was used to apply variable potential between the positive and negative supply voltage to a load connected between the two devices. While potentiometers are suitable to adjust the voltage of low power devices manually, transistors can be used to control even high power devices by nearly any electronic circuit. This H-bridge is composed of two NPN and two PNP transistors. The resistance of the lower NPN transistors is decreasing while the potential between ground and X2 respectively X4 is increasing. Here, the voltage at X4 is increasing. At a potential of approximately 1 volt, the resistance of the emitter collector line is decreasing clearly by what the LED connected in parallel to the transistor is turned off. The resistance and so the voltage across the emitter collector line becomes minimal if the potential at the input clamps equals the supply voltage of the circuit. The series resistors connected to the base pins are limiting the base current. In contrast, the resistance of the PNP transistors is minimal whenever the potential between ground and X1 respectively X3 is 0 volts, while it is maximal if the potential at the input clamps equals the supply voltage. The LED gets lighted up at a potential of approximately 4.3 volts. The transistor is turned off. When connecting X1 and X2 to ground, respectively X3 and X4 to the positive supply voltage, the resistance of transistor 2 and 3 is at its maximum, while those of transistor 1 and 4 is at its minimum. As a result, the potential at the midpoint of the left leg is 4.1V, while those at the midpoint of the right leg is 0.6V. In sum, there is a difference in potential of 3.5V between the two midpoints of the H-bridge. If a load is connected between the two midpoints, a current is running from the positive terminal via transistor 1 from the left to the right midpoint through the load and finally via transistor 4 to the negative terminal. The situation alters if X1 and X2 are connected to the positive terminal, while X3 and X4 are connected to ground. Now transistor 1 and 4 are turned off, while transistor 2 and 3 are turned on, hence the positive terminal is at the right side of the load. If all four clamps are connected to ground, the upper PNP transistors are turned on, while the lower NPN types are turned off. The potential at both midpoints of the bridge equals nearly the positive supply voltage, which is why no current is running through the load. If all clamps are connected to the positive terminal of the supply voltage, the upper PNP transistors are turned off, while the lower NPN types are turned on. The potential at both midpoints is nearly 0 volts, hence there is also no current running through the load. When composing an H-bridge of bipolar junction transistors, the base current required to bring the transistors into saturation mode has to be considered. The dimensions of R1 to R4 depend on the supply voltage. The resistance value has to be doubled when operating the circuit with an input voltage of 12 volts instead of 6 volts. Using N-channel respectively P-channel MOSFETs instead of NPN or PNP types gives you some benefits. 
just 4 pull up or pull down resistors are required and the values of R1 to R4 are not critical, simply use the relative high values to avoid operating near the maximal power dissipation. The minimal input voltage of the circuit is affected by the source gate voltage required to turn the MOSFETs reliably on. It must be clearly higher than the threshold voltage. The 3.3V supply voltage used here are not sufficient to turn the transistors fully on. When using an input voltage of 5V, the transistors are turning on reliably. And when using 12V, the potential between the clamps of the load is sufficient to turn the electric motor. An H-bridge is often composed with just two input clamps to reduce the number of required control pins. The potential at the input clamps is pulled to ground by two resistors, by what the low side transistors are turned off, while the high side transistors are turned on, no current is running through the load. If the right input clamp is connected to the positive terminal, transistor 1 and 4 are turned on and the positive pole is at the left side of the load. If the left input clamp is connected to the positive terminal, transistor 2 and 3 are turned on and the positive pole is at the right side of the load. If both clamps are connected to the positive terminal, the low side transistors are turned on and once more, no current is running through the load. A disadvantage of those simple control is that there is no way to turn all four transistors simultaneously off. The maximal supply voltage should be clearly below the maximal source gate voltage to avoid operating at the limit. Keep voltage peaks in mind when switching inductive loads. If the supply voltage exceeds the maximal source gate voltage of the MOSFETs, Four voltage dividers, each composed of a SENA diode and a constant resistor should be inserted. The SENA voltage must be clearly higher than the threshold voltage required to turn the transistors on. Now, the maximal source drain voltage, which is usually significantly higher than the maximal source gate voltage, limits the input voltage of the circuit. The clamps must always be connected to either the positive or the negative supply voltage. Here, the left input clamp is connected to the positive terminal of the voltage source, by what transistor 1 is turned off completely, while number 2 is turned on completely. The voltage at the right input clamp is 0V, by what transistor 3 is turned on and transistor 4 is turned off. The voltage at the right clamp is increasing slowly. At a potential of approximately 1.8V, the threshold at the gate of transistor 4 is reached, consequently the resistance of its source drain line is decreasing. Between source and gate of transistor 3, there is a voltage drop of approximately minus 10V, hence those device is still turned on. The current running through the right leg of the H-bridge is increasing clearly. The electric power dissipated by transistor 4 is increasing too, which is why this device is heating up strongly in just some seconds. If the voltage at the right input clamp would be kept at a level of 2V, the H-bridge would be destroyed in just some seconds. If half of the input voltage is applied to the right input clamp, the current is increasing to almost 5 amps for a short span of time, until the power source cuts off the supply voltage automatically. During a switching operation of the H-bridge, meaning whenever the potential at one of the clamps alters from the positive supply voltage to 0V or vice versa, there is always a high current running through the legs of the circuit for a short span of time. The overlapping turn on time is called cross conduction or shoot through. If the bridges are actuated manually, like seen at this video, the switching operations are relatively slow and caused by contact bounds, the bridges get switched several times in quick succession. Both effects cause high currents running through the legs of the H-bridge, which may destroy the circuit. While recording the sequences of this video, I have smoked more than just one transistor. Mostly, the devices are destroyed in pair. The input clamps of an H-bridge should always be connected to the input circuit before turning on the supply voltage. Moreover, the slew rate of the input signal should be as high as possible. 
A turn-on delay implemented by a linear RC circuit prevents the H-bridge from a shoot through. Whenever the voltage at X1 alters from the positive supply voltage to 0 volts, capacitor 1 gets charged slowly via resistor 1, hence the turn-on procedure of transistor 1 is delayed. In contrast, capacitor 2 gets discharged quickly through diode 2 which is forward biased, hence transistor 2 is turned off with almost no delay. There is always a small capacitance at the gate area of MOSFETs, so the external capacitors could eventually be omitted. R5 and R6 are pull down resistors. The high side MOSFET is turned off immediately, observable by the yellow curve, because the discharging current of capacitor 1 is running through the forward biased diode number 1. The turn on procedure of the low side MOSFET is delayed because the charging current of capacitor 2 is running through resistor number 2. At the falling edge of the input signal, the turn off procedure of the low side MOSFET marked by the green curve is faster than the turn on procedure of the high side MOSFET because now diode number 2 is forward biased. In slow motion you can see that both transistors are turned off simultaneously for a short span of time. The RC circuit impedes the overlapping turn on time of both transistors, but also lowers the maximum switching frequency. If partial power is required for the load, the H bridge can be controlled by a fast pulse width signal, but to avoid the cross conduction during each switching operation of the pulse width signal, the circuit has to be altered. The P-channel MOSFETs are still switched directly by the signal at X1 respectively X2, while the N-channel MOSFETs are controlled by the signal at X1 respectively X2 and the pulse wise signal. If the positive supply voltage is attached to X1, transistor 1 is turned off. Transistor 2 is not turned on until the pulse wise signal is also on high level. If one of the clamps is connected to ground, Transistor 2 is turned off, because diode 1 or 2 or both are forward biased, pulling the gate of transistor 2 to ground. On the other hand, if X1 is on low level, transistor 1 is always turned on, while transistor 2 is always turned off, even if the pulse white signal is at high level, because the potential at the base of transistor 2 is always pulled to ground via diode number 1. The same is for X2 and the pulse width signal. With X1 and X2, the polarity of the voltage across the load can be controlled, while the power control is done via the pulse width signal at the third input clamp. The diodes are forming an AND gate. Whenever the polarity is altered, a shoot through will occur if the pulse width signal is at high level. Ensure that the pulse width signal is set to low level before altering the polarity. Here you can see the load being controlled by pulse width modulation. The pulse width signal is permanently low, hence the two low side transistors and transistor 3 are turned off. Nevertheless, the LED at transistor 3 is not lighted up, because there is a balance in potential between the two midpoints across the load. There is almost no current running through the load. If a pulse width signal is applied to the input, the motor starts turning and LED number 3 is now lighted up like expected. When swapping the voltage level at X1 and X2, the motor turns anti-clockwise. When operating the H bridge with a supply voltage of 12V, the high level at the input clamps must also be 12V. For example computers provide an output voltage of just 5 or 3.3V. The solution of the problem is to insert three amplifying circuits. Now the transistors of the H bridge can be controlled by an input voltage of just 3.3V. Keep in mind that the voltage level is inverted by each amplifying stage. For example, a high level at the input clamp of the pulse width signal becomes a low level at diode 2 and 4, hence a low level at the pulse width signal is required to power the load between the midpoints of the H bridge. Vice versa, a high level at the pulse width signal is required to prevent cross conduction when altering the polarity of the H bridge. 
when removing the pull down resistor at X2 and connecting those input clamp to the drain pin of transistor 5, which is the MOSFET used to amplify the signal of X1, two input pins are sufficient to control the H bridge. X1 controls the polarity of the H bridge. The positive pole is at the left side of the load while X1 is connected to high level and the positive pole is at the right side while X1 is connected to low level. The second pin is the pulse width signal used to control the power supplied to the load. Like mentioned at the video about pulse width modulation, a flyback diode can be used to minimize distortions caused by inductive loads. Those diode has to be connected in parallel to the load but with reverse polarity. When using an H bridge to control a load, the polarity can be altered, hence the diode would become forward biased. To avoid this, four diodes are required to create the wanted effect of a single flyback diode at a single switch. If the positive potential of the induced voltage is at the left side of the load, a current running through diode 1 and 4 is eliminating the voltage spike. Vice versa, if the positive pole is at the right side and so the negative pole at the left, the current is running through diode 2 and 3. When switching an electric motor by an H bridge, another effect of the flyback diodes has to be considered. Caused by the inertia, the motor won't stop immediately if no more power is delivered to the device. The motor continues spinning and starts operating as a generator. The polarity of the thereby induced voltage is identical to those applied to the motor beforehand. The current running through the flyback diodes and through the windings of the motor is now slowing down the device, remember that mechanical energy is converted into electric energy. The effect is marginal because the voltage generated by the spinning motor must be higher than the supply voltage, which occurs just for a very short span of time after the power was cut off by the H bridge. A fraction of the generated electric power is dissipated as heat in the flyback diodes and the wire of the motor, while the rest is returned to the supply line. A more complex circuit is required to return the generated power safely to the battery of a vehicle, which is called regenerative braking. Even without the flyback diodes, the process of dynamic braking can be controlled by the H bridge. If all transistors are turned off, no current is running through the windings of the motor, hence the motor is spinning without being slowed down by dynamic braking. The slowing down of the motor is caused by friction. To activate the process of dynamic braking, the two high side MOSFETs have to be turned on. Now there is a conductive path between the clamps of the motor, which is why it is actively slowed down while electric power is generated. The electric power is dissipated as heat in the transistors and the wire of the motor, which is why those kind of braking is called rheostatic. The brake can also be activated by turning the two low side transistors on. The majority charge carriers of P channel MOSFETs are holes whose mobility is lower than those of electrons, the majority charge carriers inside of N-channel types. As a result, the on resistance of P-channel MOSFETs is usually higher than those of N-channel MOSFETs, assuming identical dimensions of the devices. To minimize the power dissipated by an H bridge, four N-channel MOSFETs can be used instead of two N-channel types at the low side and two P-channel types at the high side. This circuit is connected to a supply voltage of 5 volts. X3 is connected to ground, hence transistor 3 is turned off. X4 is connected to the positive terminal, hence transistor 4 is turned on. The potential at the right midpoint is 0 volts. The situation at the left half bridge is tricky. X2 is connected to ground by what transistor 2 is turned off. X1 is connected to the positive terminal, but transistor 1 is still not turned on completely, as you can see at the slightly lighted LED. 
If transistor 1 would be turned on completely, the potential at the midpoint of the left leg would be around plus 5 volts. The resulting potential between source and gate of transistor 1 would be nearly 0 volts by what the device would be turned off. If transistor 1 and 2 would be turned off, the potential at the left midpoint would be around plus 2.5V, resulting in a source gate voltage of plus 2.5V at transistor 1, which would be sufficient to turn the device on. So the truth is between the two extremal values. As you can see, a potential of approximately 3.2V can be detected at the midpoint, by what the resulting source gate voltage is around 1.8V, which is the threshold voltage of the used MOSFET, hence transistor 1 is not turned fully on. To be able to turn transistor 1 fully on, a potential above 7V, which is 5V plus 2V threshold voltage must be applied to the gate pin of the high side MOSFET, hence a second power supply is required. By using 12V, the two high side MOSFETs can be reliably turned on. The circuit driving the MOSFETs is more complex than those of an H-bridge composed of P-channel MOSFETs at the high side. You can purchase H-bridges manufactured as integrated circuits. The L298N contains two H-bridges and it is additionally featured with protection against too high currents or too high temperature. By using the two H-bridges of a single L298N, a bipolar stepper motor can be actuated. The pulses are calculated and generated by a microcontroller. That's all about H-bridges for today. You can find some more stuff about those theme at the project page. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.